Let's talk about the basics. Dermatofibroma, we got to start there if we're talking about fibrohistiocytic lesions. And I guess I should say, you know, we always have called these things fibrohistiocytic, but I think there's growing, uh, growing thought that maybe these are not really uh, uh, histiocytic at all, these things. They're probably um, related to fibroblasts or myofibroblastic differentiation. Dermatofibromas and many other things that get uh, classified as fibrohistiocytic in origin. So benign fibrous histiocytoma is the, the kind of soft tissue pathology name that often gets given to dermatofibroma. And as you all know, these are uh, papules that are usually firm, often on the extremities, maybe the trunk sometimes, and occasionally can be on the head and neck. Uh, they tend to be pigmented, and usually clinically they're obvious to the dermatologist, but sometimes they can mimic other things like basal cell carcinoma, seborrheic keratosis, or nevus. I see them sent in as rule out nevus or seb or basal cells sometimes. And the classic example right here, the, the spindle cell proliferation in the dermis, kind of poorly defined and, and trickling um, at the edges into the adjacent collagen with some of that nice collagen trapping. And oftentimes you'll see epidermal hyperplasia, acanthosis of the epidermis with, with elongated reedy that are flattened at the bottom or tabling as we sometimes call it. Here's another example, and one of my uh, wonderful former fellows, Dr. Gina Johnson, she always liked to say these are tables and chairs. I'm not sure which ones are the chairs and which are the tables, but I thought that was kind of a fun way to remember it. And sometimes the epidermal changes can have a variety of other um, adnexal uh, flavors to them. One of the most common would be the induction of benign hair follicle epithelium to grow, and this can mimic basal cell carcinoma. So it, as a test question for the junior people in the audience, if you see a, uh, a dermatofibroma that looks like it has a basal cell carcinoma over top of it, no, the answer is epidermal induction. But in real life, I have actually seen a few examples of bona fide basal cell carcinoma uh, growing over top of a DF. And in one of those, there was actually induction next to it, which kind of raises the question, did, did that uh, arise from the induction or was it coincidence? I don't know. Uh, but I, that's actually, I've got a whole slight image of that on that uh, Kiko page that I mentioned earlier, so you can check it out if you want. And sometimes the DF underneath the, the hyperplasia or underneath the induction can be very subtle, just some little spindled or curved or crescent-shaped cells that are wrapping around sclerotic collagen bundles. So uh, on a thin shave biopsy, it's easy to overlook these kind of subtle sclerotic or atrophic forms of dermatofibroma. Here's the beautiful collagen entrapment that you see at the edge. The uh, thick, almost keloidal sometimes collagen bundles get wrapped around by the dermatofibroma spindle cells. It can be abundant like here. It can be focal. It can be absent sometimes. It's a nice, pretty thing when you see it, but do keep in mind that it's not totally specific. I have seen uh, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans with some degree of collagen entrapment, albeit not usually so perfectly wrapped like this, but I have seen collagen bundles trapped in the edge of dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. So it's not a perfect, um, a perfectly specific finding. Oh, and I should mention I've occasionally seen uh, a few examples of DFSP that had epidermal induction type changes over top as well. Uh, certainly uncommon, but it happens. And the spindle cells can take a range of different patterns, okay? Uh, I think oftentimes they're kind of haphazard, kind of interspersed between the collagen bundles, almost making like little tiny cords or chains, maybe uh, subtly, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, they can also form short fascicles and they can even be story form uh, in configuration. And I know that's the buzzword for DFSP, but I've seen many dermatofibromas that are totally benign that have story form patterns. So that's important to recognize that not all that story forms is DFSP. At least that's what William Shakespeare said, I think. And here's another DF that has a kind of more sheet-like, uh, very plump spindle cells. Now, I think the, the, the large nucleus with kind of more abundant cytoplasm, that plump kind of chubby look to the spindle cells is really helpful because that's something that you're basically never going to see in DFSP. DFSP has thin, stretched out little spindle cells that look almost like the cells of a, of a neurofibroma maybe more than they do the cells of a dermatofibroma. Now, there are some exceptions. You can see dermatofibroma with thin, uh, elongated spindle cells. I've certainly seen dermatofibromas that had uh, areas resembling DFSP, but, but most times you will see some degree of plump cells, even some degree of atypia, and that's a very reassuring finding, kind of paradoxically, is reassuring that you're dealing with a dermatofibroma, not a DFSP. Mitoses are common, and sometimes they can be, I mean, 
relatively abundant. There's no like special count that if you have more than X number of mitoses per high power field that you should call it a sarcoma. There are rare, rare, rare exceptions of times where you can see uh, actual frank sarcomatous transformation of dermatofibroma. But I mean, I've seen a few of those in my entire career. It's, it's very case reportable actually, even if it's so rare. So uh, in general, if it looks classic for DF, uh, don't worry about mitoses, that's fine. And hemosiderin, really helpful. Uh, hemosiderin is often present in DFs. It can be abundant, and when it's really abundant, sometimes people call those hemosiderotic uh, dermatofibromas. Uh, when it's present with blood-filled spaces, you can call it aneurysmal dermatofibroma. But oftentimes, you'll find a, uh, some hemosiderin and some blood in a dermatofibroma. Both of those things, to me, are very reassuring findings against the DFSP and towards dermatofibroma because DFSP almost never has hemosiderin in it or blood-filled spaces in my experience experience at least. And I've probably seen, I don't know, 100 or so DFSPs in my career and, and training, maybe more. I've, I've lost count at this point. Oftentimes the hemosiderin will be um, inside um, a foamy uh, multinucleated cells that kind of look almost like Teuton giant cells up here. And the, the foam uh, layer on the outside will have some little speckles of hemosiderin in it. And of course you can see it also in hemosiderophages uh, scattered in the background, you know, kind of traditional hemosiderin pattern. But, uh, but I find that, that, that the more of these multinucleated foamy cells you have, that's often where you're going to find the hemosiderin. And those changes that we're seeing right here go hand in hand with blood uh, spill. Uh, you find more foam, more multinucleation, more hemosiderin uh, in dermatofibromas that have more blood and hemorrhage in them. Now, this is an important thing to remember that even though dermatofibromas are classically centered in the dermis and don't have much in the way of fat trapping, you can see extension into the subcutis. It's really common to see a little bit of extension like we're seeing in the upper left corner there with a little bit of fat trapping at the bottom of a dermatofibroma. That is incredibly common and nothing to be concerned about whatsoever. Cases like this cause people to be a bit more concerned because this tumor is almost more in the subcutis than in the dermis. And that does happen. Sometimes you can see dermatofibromas that are actually centered completely in the subcutis without dermal involvement, or that are mostly in the subcutis like here. But this kind of finger-like extension into the sub the subcutaneous fat is, is relatively common in DFs to some extent, and occasionally can be extensive like this. Now, one thing that can be helpful is that in dermatofibroma, when they extend into fat, oftentimes the fat begins to undergo fat necrosis. So you'll see the fat cells breaking down and, and you'll see fat cells of variable size. You'll see foamy histiocytes and a little bit of inflammation in the background. Whereas DFSP, when it infiltrates the fat, is very clean. It wraps the fat tightly and the fat seems to be trapped, but not dying, not undergoing fat necrosis, not with foamy histiocytes usually. So that can be a clue in addition to the other things we talked about. But don't be alarmed if you do see a dermatofibroma that otherwise looks perfect for DF, but is deep down and extending into the fat. Sometimes they can even be in the deep muscle, like, like in, the, you know, in the middle of the quadriceps. That's pretty rare, but it certainly has been known to occur. Now here's an example, another one of a, of a kind of DF that's a bit on the cellular side, centered in the dermis, but it's extending down quite a bit into the fat. Again, even from low power, you can see the fat cells are of variable size and shape, which is because there's some degree of fat necrosis going on. We've got nice epidermal hyperplasia with tabling and flattening of the reedy, and there's the Grenz. I, I personally don't find the Grenz zone, uh, uh, you know, that zone of spared dermis between a lesion and the epidermis for any junior people watching this. I don't personally find it a very useful concept for most things. A lot of times dermatofibromas have them, but I will tell you, I, did, I, didn't, uh, I forgot to include a picture here, but in DFs that get picked at and, and perigo change and irritated and excoriated, as people pick at a dermatofibroma, it often pushes up into the epidermis, the Gren zone disappears, and the epidermis actually, instead of being hyperplasia over top, is actually atrophy. It's very thin, it almost, the DF is like pushing up and almost wants to break through the epidermis. So those dermatofibromas that are irritated, they tend to totally lose their Gren zone in the middle and have atrophy over the, the surface. I should have put a picture of that in there. I'll have to remember that for the next time I talk about dermatofibromas. But um, as we look closer at this particular example, I wanted to show it to you just to highlight another view of look at the fat entrapment. That's okay. Don't worry. We've also got nice collagen trapping up here in the top left corner. That's a great clue for DF. Don't worry about this fat. There's some fat necrosis and breakdown there, which is the kind of uh, change you see in a dermatofibroma 
that involves fat. But look at this, this is the same lesion in the middle. That's about as beautiful a story form as you could ask for. But it's still not a DFSP, it's dermatofibroma. You can have story four patterns sometimes in dermatofibroma. And here in another area of the same lesion, we see hemosiderum, and we see very plump, juicy, chubby, whatever words you like. I think in I gave a, a lecture in Quebec a few years ago, and a lot of the lectures were in French. And one of the lovely things that I learned was the word cheflu, which is, I guess, French, and forgive my pronunciation for any French speakers in the audience. Uh, cheflu means chubby. And I thought, oh, that's so great, because I kept hearing the, the soft tissue pathologist saying that word. And they're, I think, talking about a dermatofibroma. And I'm like, they're right, they're chubby cells. And I love that. They're a little bit overweight, okay? And that's helpful, these big, plump, guys right there look at those guys and these ones over here those are not the cells of dfsp okay um uh, dfsp rarely can have pigment in it but that pigment is not going to be hemosiderin it's going to be melanin and that that variant of dfsp is uh, referred to by the eponym bednar tumor but in a dermatofibroma you're going to see hemosiderin okay so this is a nice example that here's the low power again that's a dermatofibroma not dfsp now, cellular DFs, um, my mentor, uh, Sharon Weiss, she really liked to reserve the use of the term cellular DF, particularly for dermatofibromas that were big and deep and cellular and had intersecting fascicles. Um, some people will use that term for any DF that's, that's large and hypercellular. I feel like there's not a perfect uh, definition in the literature, or at least if there is, I've not come across it. So uh, for what is cellular DF versus just regular DF. But I think the one point that I did learn from Dr. Weiss was that the, the importance of cellular DF is A, they can look scary, particularly when they have intersecting fascicles. People can start thinking that there's some sort of uh, tumor with fibrosarcomatous change, like a fibrosarcomatous DFSP, or, or um, you know, maybe I've seen people confuse them with sarcomas because of the fascicles. Um, um, the, but people get concerned about it being a sarcoma, okay? Uh, because it'll be big, it'll be cellular, it'll have intersecting fascicles, it'll have mitoses. All of those things are concerning to people. And yet these tumors are, are technically benign. There are rare examples of dermatofibroma that can metastasize to different sites. Uh, to distant sites, particularly the lungs. But, uh, and it turns out that those very rare cases tend to be cellular DFs or aneurysmal DFs, DFs that are large and deep. But that said, we can't predict which DFs are gonna metastasize. And it's so incredibly rare that I personally don't even bring this up at all in my pathology reports, unless there's been a case that metastasizes. I don't tell people, oh, cellular DFs can sometimes metastasize. I think that's overkill. That's gonna freak out the patient and the treating physician and and gonna result in excessive surgery, probably with big margins that's not needed. Um, and uh, also that's like telling every patient with a basal cell carcinoma, well, sometimes basal cell carcinomas metastasize and kill people. Yeah, that's true, but it's pretty rare, right? So same thing in uh, dermatofibromas. So anyway, there's a little tangent there. I was gonna not go down that road, but I decided to anyway. Uh, sometimes that happens. So the, the thing about cellular DFs is that they persist or recur more often. And this is a little bit complicated. In the past, people would say it was up to, you know, 50%. Some more recent studies have come out, a, a nice paper just a few years ago by Keith Duffy and colleagues came out and found, I think that the recurrence rate was about 10%. Uh, it, was, it was much lower. And he had also mentioned at a meeting before, at one of the American Society of Dermpath meetings, that anecdotally, um, if you remove the bulk of a cellular DF, even if the margins are focally positive, usually it will not recur. And so I actually do mention that in, in my reports that, that you know, removing the bulk of the lesion is probably acceptable. I do not think that you need to go do, you know, two centimeter margins or, or you know, big, you know, extensive surgical excision or Mohs to try to make sure that you have negative margins like you would for a DFSP. I personally think that that's overkill. And I'm not even 100% sold on the idea that you have to excise these completely. I do usually mention that because cellular DFs are usually larger and go deeper in the skin, they tend to persist or recur more often than conventional DFs. And that excision uh, could be considered to reduce that risk. But I, I really leave that up to the treating physician and the patient. So there you go. That's my two cents on that. And I'm sure that there are probably some people in the audience that disagree with that, and I'm okay with that. I, I think that it's not a hard, fast uh, rule on this, and there are differences of opinion. And I, I will say one last thing. I'm sorry again for the tangent, but hopefully you'll forgive it, because people ask me about this a lot, and I, I guess I should have just made a slide for it. But uh, the other thing is I feel a lot of the times so-called recurrence, and I'm using air quotes here, of cellular DF is because someone did a shave biopsy and took off the top of a, you know, a 
three centimeter, you know, uh, dermatofibroma. And so, yeah, if you shave the top of that off, you're just getting the tip of the iceberg. The bulk of the lesion is left down in the dermis. So of course it's going to continue to grow. So that's more like persistence and continued growth rather than recurrence. It's not recurring because a tiny focus was aggressively, actively growing and, and, and grew back, you know, it's just growing because you just took the top off of it. And of course it's going to keep growing. If you do that, you know, you just took the top of the golf ball and the rest of that thing is sitting down in the dermis. Or, or subcutus. So I think a lot of times the label of recurrence is probably not really accurate. It's probably just persistence of a partially sampled dermatofibroma that people are seeing. All right. And then also cellular DF sometimes can have focal necrosis. And that's a little bit disconcerting when you see that. Uh, but just know that I think it's up to 10% of cellular DFs in, in some studies can have necrosis. I, I feel like that's maybe a bit more common than I actually see it in my practice. But don't be surprised if you see some necrosis in a cellular DF. Here's one that's deeper down. So I find that when a DF is large and deep and has a, a you know a massive Gren zone, like look, there's like a mile or a couple kilometers, I guess, I don't know. There's a kilometer or more of, of uh, uninvolved dermis there between the epidermis and the tumor. And I think that the deeper down the top of a DF is, the less and less epidermal induction type changes and epidermal hyperplasia or tabling that you see. So this epidermis is, to my eye, more or less normal, doesn't really have any tabling or any of that, um, that epidermal change that we see over DF. So don't be surprised, particularly if you get one of these DFs that's way, way down. And this one was very large. I think it was like four or five centimeters and it was quite cellular, although it didn't really have fascicles. It had sheets of cells, very blue and cellular. It had blood filled spaces, filled with blood and foamy histiocytes and hemosiderin. As you get large DFs, you can sometimes even have these big vessels in it, some almost staghorn-like or hemangioperiocytic vessels. Uh, you can see that in large, deep DFs. You can see that also pretty common in dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans to see staghorn uh, vessels similar to the ones you'd see in a solitary fibrous tumor, uh, particularly in fibrosarcomatous DFSP. is really common to see that vas uh, vascular pattern. So um, this particular case I remember well uh, because it was sent in and the outside uh, person, uh, they were concerned because of how cellular it was and they thought that it was going to end up being a sarcoma. And I said, nope, this is just a big, very juicy cellular and aneurysmal dermatofibroma. Here, there, when blood is abundant, so are foam cells and so is hemosiderin. It's kind of a general a rule that those go hand in hand. The other thing I've seen sometimes in dermatofibromas with abundant bleeding and hemorrhage and aneurysmal change is you can sometimes have an accumulation of Langerhan cells within the lesion. And that can uh, can be a little disturbing if you do a stain like S100, you're gonna be like, whoa, blown away by how much S100 is there. But then if you follow that up with a SOX10, all that will disappear and you'll see this is not actually a melanocytic lesion. Those are just uh, a numerous Langerhan cells within the lesion. So, so just keep that uh, in mind that you can sometimes have a colonization with abundant Langerhans cells. And you can solve that either by using SOX instead of S100 if you were, if you were doing an S100 here because you were worried about a, a melanocytic tumor, for example. You could use SOX instead, or you could do a CD1A and show that, yeah, those S100 positive cells, they're just all Langerhans cells. So remember, there's a mixture of cells present in dermatofibroma. The, the, the fibrohistiocytic cell, again, we don't really know what that is, probably because it doesn't really exist. It's probably that these tumors are composed of some modified fibroblast or myofibroblast. Um, uh, and there are um, uh, dendritic cells that colonize the, the lesion, histiocytes, and some, some inflammatory cells as well, all in varying proportion. But, but the main cell probably is a fibroblast or myofibroblast, we think. And here's a closer look that lets you see some multinucleated cells, some foam cells, and some hemocytorin. And look at how plump, how chubby those cells are, right? They're big, fat, almost oval to round in this case. They're not always spindled. They can be oval to round in configuration. And there's an example of one with really dramatic uh, aneurysmal change. And just like cellular DFs tend to be larger and deeper, um, and have a bit more of a tendency to persist or recur. The same exact rule, I think, applies to aneurysmal DFs. And I feel like aneurysmal and cellular DF often kind of can coexist in the same lesion. And this one's got nice epidermal hyperplasia and tabling or flattening of the reedy. And it actually has a nice grand zone too. So I guess the rules do work sometimes. So that's a nice example of aneurysmal change in a dermatofibroma.
And look at that, the monster cell. Uh, I love seeing monster cells. I love pointing them out to my trainees. And then I signed the case out as dermatofibroma with no mention of monster cells. No patient wants to see a report that says they've got monster anything inside their body, right? The only time I really will ever mention it is in the past, I used to take uh, second opinion consult cases. I've tried to stop doing that in the past couple of years after switching to a new job because I like having time home with my family, it turns out. It's quite nice to see your kids more and not sign out cases all the time. So I've uh, tried to, to cut back on that. Um, but one thing that I would say is that if someone sent me a case in consultation and they were worried about the atypia, then I would tell them, yeah, this scattered pleomorphism or so-called air quotes, monster cells, is a, is a common finding in DF and is totally benign, okay? If you start seeing numerous atypical cells, areas that resemble like pleomorphic sarcoma in the middle of a tumor that otherwise looks like a DF, then what you're probably dealing with is so-called atypical fibrocysteocytoma or atypical dermatofibroma. And those are lesions that, that can occasionally metastasize but usually have a good prognosis. They do need complete excision, I think. And uh, Chris Fletcher has written about this and I think his series is the largest to date. But just scattered atypia, to me, that's not enough to call something an atypical dermatofibroma or an atypical fibrocysteocytoma. You really need to have a lot of atypical cells, atypical mitosis. I mean, it should, it should border on a high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma appearance, not just random scattered pleomorphism, okay? So I do have some uh, an example of that or in another video. It's in that index I talked about at the beginning that goes over and shows a nice example of, of atypical fibrocysteocytoma. So uh, that's a, the, the close-up on the monster cell right there. And also some beautiful Teuton-like cells, um, or I mean, I guess they really are Teuton giant cells. Why not? They've got a ring of nuclei and they've got foam around the outside. So I think Teuton giant cells are actually pretty common in DFs, particularly the ones that have some aneurysmal change or hemosiderin deposition. And uh, don't let that confuse you for a, you know, a juvenile xanthogranuloma. If I see uh, EOs and Teuton giant cells, then I start thinking, could it be a JXG, especially if it's a younger patient um, or a site like the face where uh, xanthogranuloma would be more common than dermatofibroma. Uh, dermatofibromas do occur on the face sometimes, and I feel like when that happens, they most often are deeper, and they're cellular, and they're usually in kids or young adults. So uh, just so you are aware of that, um, uh, that you, know, you can have dermatofibromas on the face, but usually they're cellular DFs, and they're usually in young people. I'm pretty wary of making that diagnosis in like an old sun damaged person uh, where the differential would be like AFX or pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. I've seen that come up a few times, but, but I'm always a lot more cautious there. All right. And uh, one of my favorites, I love these. They're so cool to, to see. And it, it turns out to work so nicely. These are called lipidized dermatofibroma. And the lipidized variant of DF um, is very often occurs on the lower leg or the ankle. So they're kind of so-called ankle type or lower leg type dermatofibroma, uh, colloquially, just for fun. And I, I think it works out pretty well that you the vast majority of these I've seen are on the ankle or the lower leg, somewhere below the knee. I don't know why that site predisposes to this, but it really seems to. And so you get um, the, the uh, abundance or the, the preponderance of lesional cells in this type of dermatofibroma look just like xanthoma cells. They're foamy histiocytes, some with plump nuclei. And then uh, usually though, if you have a complete um, sample of one of these, at the periphery, you'll see stuff that looks more like conventional DF, has some collagen trapping, but in the middle, they look like this, like a xanthoma. But the one difference from a, 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 an actual bona fide xanthoma is the sclerotic collagen. Um, my, my former partner at, uh, at University of Arkansas, Sarah Shalin, who's just a brilliant dermatopathologist and someone who's just taught me so much and supported my career from day one. Uh, I love that one of the things she taught me is that the, these are rings and arcs of sclerotic collagen. And I, I can't recall having heard that before until she taught that to me. And I think she learned it from one of her mentors. But I really love that, um, that uh, expression because they do that the collagen is so sclerotic and dense and pink and hyalinized and it curves and curls cues and makes these arches and arcs and rings that wrap around the individual foamy cells. So it's quite lovely to look at and I, I really um, get it happy whenever I see these. I've seen some pretty big ones too. I saw one that was taken off from the ankle that was like five or six centimeters and it was like golden yellow when we cut it open grossly. It was taken off by an orthopedic oncologist because it was big enough on scan that they were concerned it might be a sarcoma. But thankfully for the patient, it was benign.
And this is an important thing that I really want to make sure everyone in the audience knows. This is what CD34 looks like in a, in a big kind of juicy uh, dermatofibroma, particularly like a large cellular dermatofibroma. If you do a CD34 stain, which of course we teach is CD34 negative in dermatofibroma, factor 13A positive. We'll talk about factor 13A in a second. But I think that one thing that can confuse people is that CD34 is negative in the middle of a dermatofibroma, but it tends to be strong at the periphery, stronger than the background dermis. Remember that CD34 is normally positive in dermal dendritic cells. And if you stain normal skin, there should be CD34 staining scattered throughout the dermis, like you see up here in the upper left corner. That's normal. If you don't have that, then your CD34 probably didn't work correctly. The 34 should look dirty in the dermis normally. So th that's because these dendritic cells, what I don't fully understand what they are or what they do, but they, they live there in the dermis and they stain with CD34. I can tell you that much. I'm just a simple morphologist at heart and I don't always understand the underlying uh, uh, cell biology and the, the deeper uh, nuanced truths that um, more intelligent people than me will have to explain. But what I can tell you is that these cells, what they do is when a dermatofibroma grows, it it pushes outward and those CD34 positive cells get pushed out of the way and they tend to pile up and accumulate along the periphery. I don't know if this is exactly how it happens, but in my mind, that's what I imagine happening and it makes a nice uh, memory uh, tool to think of the DF expanding and pushing the CD34 out of the way and they pile up along the edges uh, like, a, like snow in front of a snow plow or something like that. And so it's, it forms this kind of halo of darker CD34 staining at the periphery of a DF. And so this is totally normal and expected to see this in dermatofibroma. And when you've got a big um, sample like this, no problem, you can tell it's negative. But what happens if you got a shave biopsy at the top of this thing? You could see pretty much only the 34 positive halo and not see all the negative stuff down below. And if you're having a bad day, you could potentially get that confused or, or have concern for, uh, for a... Um, for a DFSP. So that's why I don't routinely order stains on dermatofibromas unless it's something where I have a partial biopsy and morphologically is challenging. Some DFs have story form pattern and thin spindle cells instead of plump spindle cells. And if I get a partial biopsy of one of those, those are the ones I often will do a CD34. And if it looks positive or, or patchy, I'll send it off for fish to make sure it's not DFSP. But if I've got a nice sample and classic DF features, I don't really feel there's any need to do Im an immunostains uh, in that setting. Now, my comfort level is probably a little different as a soft tissue trained uh, dermatopathologist because I've seen lots and lots and lots of weird variants of DF. And so it makes me really comfortable. Uh, in fact, the very first case I ever signed out um, on my own in practice, on day one of practice, was actually an aneurysmal uh, and cellular dermatofibroma. So I thought that was so fitting and I felt so comfortable having done a, a fellowship in soft tissue and derm path. I was like, this is what I prepared for. I can handle this case. And then, you know, uh, it progressively got more challenging from there. So I keep thinking one of these days, uh, derm path will get easier, but 10 years in and boy, it's still a struggle some days. So uh, if you guys ever feel like that, you're not alone. All right, well, I really went off on the, uh, off the deep end here, but I wanted you guys to know about the halo uh, around the, the dermatofibroma. And yeah, particularly on a partial sample, if you get an area like this or a punch that goes down just and gets the edge like that, you can really have trouble. In the middle, this is a different stain from a different case uh, with the red chromogen, but look, beautiful, uh, nice, uh, rich vascular network in the background. And it's okay, like I said, especially in big cellular or aneurysmal large dermatofibromas, it's common to have a pretty robust vascular network. Sometimes they're staghorn, sometimes they're really small and plexiform, but don't worry about the vessels. The point is, is that the lesional spindle cells in between are dead negative in the middle of a big juicy cellular or aneurysmal dermatofibroma. That, that halo is only out at the edge usually. All right. Now, because people do ask about it, and I know a lot of my colleagues uh, like Factor 13A, so no judgment. If you want to use it, it does usually stain dermatofibromas. But I think sometimes people have the conception that it should be like strong, diffuse wall-to-wall -wall staining. And and I like I don't pref I basically never order Factor 13A for spindle cell tumors for dermatofibroma or any other, just because it's really non-specific. So I don't find it that useful personally. But if you do, go for it. I'm not going to judge you at all. 
if you do Vimentin, I will judge you because Vimentin has absolutely no role in modern um, soft tissue uh, spindle cell tumor pathology. In other organ systems, I have no right to judge, but but I will tell you for spindle cell tumors, it's completely worthless. And I'll, I'm happy to, to have uh, conversations with people who feel otherwise. Um, so uh, that's the hill I've chosen to die on is the Vimentin hill. But in any case, uh, that, that, um, that aside, factor 13A is okay if you want to use it, uh, in my opinion. But what you will see is uh, scattered dendritic cells. Not every cell in the lesion is usually positive. It's usually these, these factor 13A dendritic cells uh, that are they're factor 13A positive and CD34 negative, and they tend to be abundant and colonize uh, the background of the dermatofibroma. But you're not going to see like a diffuse, strong staining. Usually it's more this kind of patchy, scattered dendritic staining. Okay. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that smooth muscle actin is often positive in dermatofibroma, uh, patchy usually, but in some cases, particularly ones that are kind of more fascicular, I think that they have more of a myofibroblastic phenotype. And so because of that, they tend to stain with actin. Oftentimes in that kind of tram track or train track pattern of, of parallel subplasma membrane staining that's kind of lighter and wispier and not as strong and rich and diffuse as like true smooth muscle. Uh, actin staining in a, in a smooth muscle tumor. But I, I do feel like sometimes if there's fascicular and some actin, that people have a tendency to want to call those smooth muscle tumors. And and don't do that, okay? Uh, with, with practice morphologically, um, uh, a true smooth muscle tumor should have abundant pink cytoplasm. It looks very different from fibroblastic or myofibroblastic um, proliferations or uh, including dermatofibroma, okay? And I do have a video on, on YouTube and Kiko about how to tell um, uh, myofibroblast and fibroblast from smooth muscle. And so you can go, I've got a couple videos actually about that, um, but it can be done on H&E almost always uh, with rare exceptions. So they do look different. So don't let actin make you call something smooth muscle tumor that doesn't look like a smooth muscle tumor. All right, it's positive oftentimes in DFs. Uh, don't be worried about that. In Desmond, I will point out, and this I think can be a little bit more bothersome, at least it was to me. I've seen um, a handful of Desmond positive um, uh, dermatofibromas, in, including, uh, I, I think they were mostly cellular dermatofibromas. Now, it may be that Desmond can be positive in run of the mill conventional dermatofibromas. I just don't usually stay in those. So I don't know. Maybe it is positive more often than I realize just because I'm not looking. The ones I, that tend to, I tend to see with stains, either because I've done them or someone else has done the stains, tends to be the bigger cellular, more mitotically active. You know, the more worrisome looking dermatofibromas are the ones that tend to get stains and sent in as a consult or that I tend to see from colleagues who've worked them up. So, um, uh, and I remember one particularly, and I sent it to, to Dr. Weiss actually, because uh, it was on the eyebrow of a young girl and had Desmond, a lot of Desmond, and it had some necrosis. And I thought, oh my gosh, is it a rhabdo? And uh, the myogenome was a little difficult to read, but I was worried face of a child, maybe it's rhabdomyosarcoma. And uh, she said, no, this is just a cellular DF that has Desmond expression. And um, as far as I know, everything's been fine with that child uh, years later even. Uh, and uh, I've seen, since then, I've seen other examples of, of cellular DF that have Desmond expression. So, so it's not common in my experience, but it certainly um, can happen and it's something to be aware of.